Good morning, everyone. This is our eighth Grand Dialogue annual conference that we hold. And uh, it's, it's uh, great to see so many people out again. We've had a uh, full house almost every time. I'm just curious, how many of you, is this the first time you've been to Grand Dialogue? Quite a few. Good, good. Well, welcome. Glad to have you here. I'm going to give a little introduction about the Grand Dialogue uh, before we introduce our speaker, uh, primarily for those of you that haven't been here before, so you can understand what Grand Dialogue is all about, and also how this year in particular it's related to the Grand Rapids Year of Interfaith Understanding. So my name is Doug Kinchy. I'm the project director for the Grand Dialogue and also the director of the Kaufman Interfaith Institute, which is the administrative home for the Year of Interfaith Understanding. But a little more about that in a minute. The Grand Dialogue is an interinstitutional, interdisciplinary, interfaith exploration, seeking positive ways of relating these two great ideas. The premise of the Grand Dialogue is that science and religion are the two major forces in our society. Science has a huge impact on how we live, religion huge impact on how we behave, on our ethical understandings and the way we live. The nature of the relationship between these two great forces is of great importance in our society. The strategy of the Grand Dialogue is to bring people and institutions together to share ideas and perspectives. We seek an openness to multiple perspectives, different traditions, different disciplines, different institutions, and different individual insights, together seeking understanding and meaning. We have a number of institutional members that have been supportive at the founding of the Grand Dialogue. They include Aquinas College, Calvin College, Calvin Theological Seminary, the Catholic Information Center, Cornerstone University, Grand Valley State University, Hope College, Western Theological Seminary, and the Interfaith Dialogue Association of Grand Rapids. The goal of the Grand Dialogue is that participating organizations, each with their own perspectives, focus and message and intended audience, will come together in cooperation and affirm the willingness to be open about various issues and perspectives in a spirit of mutual respect. We affirm what one believes, but we ask also that you be open to new insights and multiple perspectives in a spirit of humility. The Grand Dialogue has been in operation for, like I said, eight years now. And if you're interested in further information about it, I think most of you probably registered at our website, which is granddialogue.org. Uh, we also have uh, videos of previous conferences that are on that website and other resources that might be of interest for those that uh, are, want to follow up on the science and religion concerns. Our previous conference is just to give you a flavor of what we've been doing. Uh, in 2005, we had Michael Roos talking about the issues of evolution and creation. 2006, professor from Georgetown University, John Hott, talked about Darwin, intelligence and religion, how much can evolution really explain. Phil Clayton was here in 2007 and talked about mind, body, spirit, and perspectives of how they emerge in science and religion. Uh, in 2008, uh, Professor Howard Van Til, retired from Calvin College, talked about, is the cosmos all there is? And then we had uh, Brian Malley from the University of Michigan talking about why do people believe in gods from the cognitive religion perspective. And then uh, we had the uh, Buddhist scholar Alan Wallace uh, that talked about experience, reason, and faith, a Buddhist perspective. And last year we had Nancy Murphy from Fuller Theological Seminary, professor of philosophy there. And she spoke on do humans have souls, perspectives from the science and religion. Now, before I introduce today's speaker, I want to also mention the Grand Rapids Year of Interfaith Understanding. This is a project that Kaufman Interfaith Institute began and with the desire to have the community engaged in interfaith dialogue. Having a one time a year conference we felt wasn't enough. So we went to the mayor and to the Grand Rapids Press uh, George Hartwell said it's a great idea and he officially declared 2012 to be the Grand Rapids Year of Interfaith Understanding. 
we went to the editor of the Grand Rapids Press, Paul Keep. That's back when they had a press, do you remember? Uh, and he said, yes, we want to be part of this as well, and we will support it. We had a press conference on September 12th, and that was the idea of the editor of the press. He said, rather than waiting till January to announce the 2012 Year of Interfaith Understanding, we have a team of people working on a special edition of the press for the 9-11, the 10th anniversary of 9-11. Why don't we announce your program the day after as this community's response to the 10th anniversary of 9-11? Not only do we honor and recognize the heroes and victims of that terrible day, but let's work toward a a society, communities of peace and understanding. And so we did that, and so the, the press then gave us a front page story uh, about the Year of Interfaith Understanding. And since that time, there have been already over 100 interfaith events in our community, and we're still building uh, 20 of them just in the month of March alone. The Grand Rapids Year of Interfaith Understanding was organized around three councils, a congregations council with representatives from churches, mosques, synagogues, temples, and we now have over 150 people who are on the congregations council who have pledged to do something in their own congregation that is related to interfaith understanding. The campus council has eight colleges, seminaries, and universities, including the ones that are sponsoring the Grand Dialogue who are supportive of the Year of Interfaith Understanding. And the Community Council, we have gone to various community groups, everyone from World Affairs Council to the Grand Rapids Symphony to the Economic Club to theater groups, uh, various community groups, and ask if they would include in their programming for the year something related to interfaith understanding. And 20 community organizations have agreed to do that. And you'll see in a minute just some of the things that are happening in the community. Uh, for example, after our announcement, it turned out that Hope College had already planned a critical in, uh, issue symposium on exploring Islam and had two major uh, Muslim figures here for that event. Um, Western Theological Seminary had Dr. Martin Marty here uh, to talk uh, for an all-day conference on the presence of the religious stranger. The symphony had two sacred dimension concerts, one at Temple Emmanuel, uh, the, the Jewish uh, Reformed Temple in town, and one at the Cathedral of St. Andrew that was also tied into our year of interfaith understanding. They have also announced a major uh, interfaith uh, piece that they're gonna do as part of their classical series next November, but you'll hear more about that in the future. The Jewish Theater had a special performance of My Name is Asher Lev with an interfaith panel discussing the themes in that play. The annual Thanksgiving service, was an interfaith service, also was focused around our year of interfaith understanding. The Channel 35, the public television station, ran a, the God in America series. Uh, during January and February of this month. And there were various study groups in churches and in homes that, that watched that series together. The Dominican Center at, at Marywood uh, has established the Tuesday Table Talk every month on the third Tuesday, a, a discussion where each small table is made up of a mixture of faith traditions. And, uh, and uh, it's been a wonderful experience. R roughly, around, roughly around 100 people have, have been attending each of those. And it's a good time to have small group discussion stimulated by some panelists that, from various faith traditions that get it started. There have been book discussion groups established, uh, including the book by Mitch Album, Have a Little Faith. Uh, a book by Peter Kreeft, Between Allah and Jesus, What Christians Can Learn from Muslims. Peter Kreeft, by the way, is a Calvin graduate and now is a professor at Boston College. Uh, the Faith Club was a story of three women who, after 9-11, said we need to understand our various traditions differently. A Jewish, Christian, and Muslim women got together to talk about that. And I like to mention Grand Rapids' own faith club, which really started 10 years prior to that, back in the 90s, when Lillian Siegel, uh, the wife of the rabbi at Congregation of Havas Israel, uh, Marcin Rinstra, a Christian a minister, and Ghazala Munir, an active person in, in the Muslim community, started meeting together in an interfaith organization, which eventually grew into the Interfaith Dialogue Association. The uh, Catholic Information Center had a cinema series dealing with film that had deal with the various faith traditions. Uh, the churches in the area are running series. Here's Eastern Avenue Christian Reform, for example, that has finished up their series on understanding our neighbors. 
Uh, the St. Andrew's Episcopal Church has a series that's still going on. Uh, there has been a tour of the al Mosque on East Paris, uh, and uh, just recently the Hindu temple had an open house. So there's activities going on all over, and if you want more information about that, I would encourage you to go to our Year of Interfaith Understanding website, uh, hopefully easy to remember. It's 2012, the year, and it's in Grand Rapids, GR, so 2012gr.org is our website. We have a calendar there that uh, will tell you all of the activities that are in planning, and also a, a tab there that you can sign up for the Interfaith Inform, which is a weekly e-newsletter. Every Tuesday it comes out. We have over 2,000 people already on our e-newsletter mailing list. So if you're interested in a reminder of what's coming up in the next couple of weeks or so, sign up for Interfaith Inform at our website, 2012gr.org. Now, with that little bit of a connection to the Interfa Year of Interfaith Understanding, when we planned for this year's Grand Dialogue, we wanted to make sure it had an interfaith focus. <coughs> and uh, so we decided that we had never had someone speak about science and religion from a Jewish perspective. And the work of Dr. Gerald Schroeder uh, is well known for the work that he has done and the four books that he has published on this theme. And so we contacted him, uh, and he has joined us coming from Jerusalem, where he has lived for the last 30 years or so, and we're very pleased to have him here with us. Dr. Schroeder has a PhD from MIT in applied nuclear physics and in earth and planetary sciences. He taught at MIT for a period and then moved to Jerusalem, where he was professor at the Weizmann Institute and at Hebrew University in Jerusalem and uh, is now the, uh, teaches at Esh Hator, the College of Jewish Studies in Jerusalem. Also, uh, Dr. Schroeder just last month received the Trotter Prize uh, that is given at Texas A&M, an annual prize that's given to people who have done significant work in science and religion, and it's awarded by the science uh, department uh, at Texas A&M, so we're very pleased that he has received this award. He's the author of four books, and all four books are available at our book table. And fortunately, because we have the author here with us today, we were able to get the author discount. So uh, those, uh, those books have been greatly reduced. Each of the books are available to you for $10. The first book that he published in this field was Genesis and the Big Bang, The Discovery of Harmony Between Modern Science and the Bible. Then he published the book The Science of God, The Convergence of Science and Biblical Wisdom. His next book was The Hidden Face of God, Science Reveals the Ultimate Truth, and he deals with the mind-body, mind-brain issue there, uh, and uh, a, a, very, uh, a very interesting discussion in that book. And his latest book is God According to God, A Scientist Discovers We've Been Wrong About God All Along. He describes this book as using his physics mind to the data of the Hebrew scripture. And as he looks at, the, at, the, at that data, he says that some of our concepts that we thought we knew about God don't really fit what scripture says. And so it's a, it's a, very, uh, a very interesting uh, book. Our faculty science and religion discussion group has read both of these books and have been enchanted by his, his approach. So at this point, I'm pleased to introduce to you and hope and ask you to welcome Dr. Gerald Schroeder, who will speak to us on God and the Hebrew Bible, science in the modern world can both be true. Thank you, Professor Kinchy, for, for that nice introduction. But thank you more for letting me come here and uh, bring you greetings from my hometown, Jerusalem. Uh, thank you to the entire Grand Dialogue Committee for letting me come here. Thank you. So the approach that I would take then is to try to understand whether we can find conflict rather than, whether we can find confluence rather than conflict between the biblical understanding of how the world is put together and the scientific understanding how it's been described. 
my field in applied f nuclear physics had me present at a long series of nuclear uh, detonations, atomic bombs. And at one of them, and, well, in those days, I wasn't part of this dialogue, you know, the science, the science Bible dialogue. It wasn't of interest to me. And then suddenly, in one of those events, the entire face of a mountain disappeared in a flash. It kind of impressed me. You know, that, well, what is all this solidity about? Where did it go? And uh, that kind of jump started me on this uh, approach, this, this search to see whether or not there was something behind all of, of the power that existed. I think the difference between the, between the Bible, some, I would say Torah, I'm talking about the five books of Moses, uh, but in general, you say Bible, and I'm primarily related to the Hebrew Bible. The difference between the Bible and science is not whether or not there was a creation. Both agree, both sources of wisdom, the wisdom of science and the wisdom of the Bible, both agree by the fact that there was a creation. The question that arises primarily is how long ago did it happen? And, what, and how did it happen, in the, and how did it happen in the first place? There's no possibility that we could possibly claim that every statement in the, in the Bible has a scientific explanation. There may be explanations that are scientifically valid, but there's no claim that you could find them all. There are limits to what science can know. There are limits to what humans can know. Our imagination is locked within a box of time, space, and matter. No one thinks out of that box. If you want an example of it, just try to think right now of an edge which has an inside but no outside. Can such a thing exist? Not in our universe, because we can only think in terms of our universe. Okay, we can't abstract things like time and space. It's just something as simple as an edge. Why should I go? Or think of a universe in which there's no time. Well, that may make us look better when we look in the mirror in the morning, but uh, you know what I mean? You know, we can't. There are things that we can't. So there are limits to what we can understand. And if the creator of the universe operates without, outside of those limits, then we can, never, we can never access that. We may have examples. But we have to realize that there are limits to imagination. There are limits to, uh, to scientific inquiry. But many of the, many of the things that do, that do occur and are mentioned in the Bible, in fact, do have uh, resonate with, with the scientific understanding. Part of the difficulty, part of the difficulty in this uh, search, let us say, is that the, that the Torah devotes a total of 27 sentences from the creation of the universe to the creation of the first human being. Not the first homo sapiens sapien, the first homo sapiens sapien with the soul of a human, the neshama, the Hebrew is the neshama, the soul of a human. Homo sapiens sapiens before the first this Adam were very much similar to us according to biblical tradition. They just didn't have the soul of a, of a human. So, but why didn't God give us the whole story? Why are we limited just these 27 sentences? I mean, the, the, the difference in how the Bible relates, let's say, to the, the, the construction of the tabernacle. There are like four or five chapters. We barely get four, for the, for the development of animal life, we get six sentences. To the first mention of animals, to finally Adam, six biblical sentences. So don't expect that every detail comes popping out. But sometimes, especially in the classes I give in, in Jerusalem, you're welcome, I give the classes in, in, in English, you're certainly welcome to come. It's the old city, it's a phenomenal place. You see three, you turn your head from here to here, and you see three religions, all trying to struggle for the same piece of land, which has no water, no oil, no coal, not very good wind power either. And for 3,000 years, we've all been arguing who owns, the, who owns this place. It makes you really believe that maybe there is something spiritual about, about the world. But let's say, let's say the, uh, the Torah had in fact decided to give us the information. Don't limit it to 27 seconds. Give us the whole story. Now remember, we're talking to a, a, a just freed slaves. For centuries, they've been beaten on and held you know, in subjection. And now we're going to give this, the, God has decided to tell us the story. So a, a very dear friend of mine who passed away about a year ago, died a year ago, Arne e. Novik of uh, Providence, when he was introducing him one of the talks I was giving, several talks there in Providence, he said, this is more or less what the Bible would have had to say. It's going to give us the whole story. We'll just get, don't worry, we're going to get through the first day. We're not going to take a few billion years to get to the whole story. We'll finish it within the time I have a lot of God created the heavens and the earth. It's fine, we're going right on with the text. God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was astonishing empty, and darkness is on the surface of the deep, 
and the divine presence hovered over the surface of the waters, and God said, let there be light. No problem here. And there was a high energy plasma that burst forth from a quantum fluctuation, absolutely nothing. But as we all know, quantum physics allows creation from nothing. And God saw that light was good, but the problem is the light was trapped within the darkness of a plasma field. And everyone knows that in the plasma field, you can't have coherent information travel out. So light was trapped. So God had to separate the light from the darkness because as the plasma cooled, light began to escape from this high energy bundle. As the plasma cooled further, matter and antimatter were able to condense out of the high energy out of the high energy mix. We all know the equation equals mc squared. The difficulty was energy condenses to matter. It always produces matter and antimatter. Well, that's not too good for the matter or the antimatter, because the matter touches the antimatter, the antimatter and the matter dilate, annihilate, they go back to energy. So you're back to square one. We're back to the beginning again. But luckily, by some amazing reality, God tweaked the system, apparently, and a bit more matter, maybe one part in a million, over the antimatter survived. And that's what makes us, and this, and everything we see around. Well, I wasn't that lucky for us. And so therefore, we have to thank God, says at this point, you have to thank God for that. So as these matters interact, they unite in some, some form, some didn't form, and eventually with the, the pressure cookers of the, of the stars as they formed, due to coalescence by mutually forming gravity, the 92 elements formed. And called it light day, and called the darkness light. But that wasn't enough. There was evening and there was morning. One cosmic day, but now we've got a problem. There's no sun or moon yet. So the cosmic day was determined by counting the oscillation, the background radiation, of course, that's what you do with it. The quantum event. And Moses transmitted this to the people. The people said, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know? The point of the above, thank you, Arnie Nutter. The, the point of the above story is that God couldn't have explained the creation to the Jewish people of the, the Exodus, at the time of the Exodus, of the giving of the Torah in Sinai because it would not have been the vocabulary or even the capacity to understand it. How much of the room understand a quantum fluctuation today? Pro possibly, <laughs> I hope one of us does at least. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, God could have simply said that God created the heavens and the earth and all of it in six days. He could have said that in just one sentence, but he chose neither, he chose neither. Rather, God revealed the creation in a hidden manner, in subtlety within the text, why one word is spelled a certain way, why one word is chosen over another way, and left it as a challenge for future generations to reveal the puzzle. We literally are fortunate with the first generation that has the vocabulary and the information to demonstrate that many of the major conflicts that appear in the Torah, in the Bible, especially Genesis chapter one, are not conflicts, because we now can see the information within there's a wonderful uh, quote by, uh, I heard from, from Steve Bullen, of, uh, of Heisenberg in 1932. I think it was his Nobel, it was the Nobel Prize address. He said, he, he said the following. When you take the first sip of the cup of the natural scientists, of the natural sciences, it makes you an atheist. But when you got to the bottom of the cup, you find God is waiting. God is in the details. God's in the details. So with that background, and uh, introduction. I won't go into all those details because that would take a few billion years. But uh, we only have a few hours, but not even that. So, so what, what does it mean that we have to do? How can we read within the text to try to understand what's in those 27, or the whole chapter has 31 sentences, but by the time you get to Adam, it's only 27 sentences. How do we read within that, within the, within the subtlety of the text? For that, we have to do exactly that read within the subtlety of the text. And it's easy to bend the Bible any way you want. Unless you limit yourself, as I've limited myself in all my books and any talk I would give, on ancient biblical commentary. Ancient commentary that predates the digging up of dinosaur fossils. Ancient commentary that, that, that Hubble's great-great-grandfather and grandmother weren't even a gleam in their eye. Ancient commentary that goes back long before the discoveries of modern science and see how the commentators saw within the text, not many of the text, saw within the text statements that reflect extraordinarily on the understanding of, of the physical world that we have today. So just quickly to go through, to mention the sources for those that, that are familiar with them, the terms or not, the names or not, at least I'll give some background. The oldest, of course, would be the biblical text itself. Okay, it depends whether we take biblical criticism or not, but we know we're not something over 2,000 years old. Where the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Bible dates itself internally as 3,300 years old when you add up the generations. And then the major commentaries on the Torah, on the Bible. 
one of the oldest would be the, the Talmud. The Talmud was written down in the year 400. The earlier part of the Talmud called the Mishnah was written down in the year 200. So we're talking about things 1,600 years ago, long before the local museum had the exhibits of camp, you know, campfires going back 70,000 years. And uh, then the commentaries beyond that would be uh, for the individuals. One would be Rashi, the famous Rashi in the year 1090, that a human being could write as many, remember those days it was really manuscript, literally manuscript with by the hand, that a human being could write as many words, even if it had been just gibberish in a human, in a, a single lifetime is amazing. So Rashi is the major commentary on the meaning of the individual Hebrew words. And then after Rashi, the year 1090, about 100 years later, 1190, the philosopher, physician, theologian, Moses Maimonides, sometime called the Rambam with an M, Maimonides. And then uh, a bit more than half a decade later, about 60 years later, uh, half a century later, see, Nachmanides with an N, Ramban, Nachman. So if I say the Ramban, it's because the, the acronym is the Ramban, but his name is, is Nachmanides. He is the major Kabbalistic commentary on the Torah. Kabbalah is not mysticism. Kabbalah is the spiritual physics of the world. You can get a mystical experience when you touch it, but it's not mysticism. It's very deep understanding of the spiritual physics. At MIT, I study the material physics of the world. The spiritual physics is how God runs the world. And it's alluded to in a very, uh, let's say, central proverb. A proverb on which much of the understanding of the deeper text below the surface is based. And that's Proverb 25, verse 11. The difficulty, I'll tell you, in, in, in teaching now in these days, I've given this, my, my classes, so you make a statement like this, and you want to quote it a certain way, and what do the kids do immediately? They pull out the laptop, they see what, and they make, you can't bluff any longer. You know, they got this stuff right in front of you these days. So uh, Proverb 25, the Hebrew is, is verse 11, is, is quite difficult Hebrew, but the general translation is a word well spoken it's like apples of gold in a dish of silver. And we attribute the Proverbs to King Solomon about uh, 2,500 years ago or so. The word well spoken is like apples of gold in a dish of silver. And Maimonides asked, what was King Solomon writing about? Why should a well spoken word be like an apple of gold in a dish of silver? And he talks like, he says like this, if you look at the dish from a distance, that's all you see, the beautiful silver dish. You can see its craftsmanship, you can even see the value of it. What you can't see is what's inside, the apples of gold. What's the silver dish? The literal text of the Bible. Do this, don't do that, act this way towards people, don't act that way. That's the silver dish, it's frontal teaching. What are the apples of gold? The deeper meanings. Why the Torah chooses a word over this, over that word, why it spells differently over that way when it's talking about the forming of the animals, the Hebrew, the, the spelling of the word formed is different from the way when it talks about the forming of humans, yet the grammatical structure is identical. Why, why is it spelled differently? The apples of gold are the deeper meanings within the text. And Maimonides writes something amazing. If, he says, look what King Solomon wrote, apples of gold in a dish of silver, and not apples of silver in a dish of gold. And he writes, gold is more beautiful and more powerful and more valuable than silver. The silver dish is valuable. But the apples of gold are more valuable when you put them within the context of the silver dish. The apples of gold by themselves are meaningless. So the context of the two comes together, but it's golden apples in a dish of silver. So where can we see some of this, this amazing insight, the idea of going, below, of going below, below the surface to try to get within a deeper meaning? It's not bending the Bible. We do this all the time. Science does it. That's why we have science. I mean, if you look out in the morning, watch the sun rise in the east and it sets in the west. If you behave yourself, you're around for the next morning, sun rises in the east, sets in the west. And there goes the sun again. The silver dish reading of the, of, the, of the universe is clearly the sun is going around the earth. But the golden apple, with some looking below the surface of our simple reading, is the earth is rotating its axis, which makes it appear that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. In, and that's, in the, that's on the cosmic scale. On the micro scale, it's, I think it's even more dramatic. We look around, we find a solid table, stuff that hangs together called skin, a floor that's solid, you don't go right through it, and then you study nuclear physics. And you decide to understand the dimensions of an atom, with a T, not the atom, that, of what we're made. So if you look at it carefully, kind of like scale up, 
you know, to see it like, you know, like Sony might do or whoever might make these things. You know, so you scale it up, and we decide to make the center of the atom called the nucleus, about the size of an orange or a grapefruit, you know, something about that size, you know, several inches in diameter like that. So we know we've got the center of the atom, about like this, so we can look at it really carefully. So where do we put the electron cloud? You know, an atom is made of a nucleus, the center, and then an electron cloud that goes around it. So we get, we make the, the, the nucleus about this large, and again, about an orange or a grapefruit, something like that. So where's the electron cloud? Where's the closest cloud of the electrons? Of course, they have to be held, you know, something holding, four miles away in each direction. You have this, the size of it. Imagine if someone offered you all the wealth in the world, and they give you a, a, uh, a volume eight miles in, in diameter, four miles in each direction, it's eight miles in diameter. They fill it with everything. You say inside of that, you know, these, these ping pong balls, there's one red ping pong ball. You would spend your life and you couldn't find it. But every atom of which you're made is exactly like that. That, that relationship is one part in a thousand, in a thousand billion, it's 15 zeros. The solidity of an atom is one part in a thousand billion, one and 15 zeros after that. And yet, I didn't go through the floor. Well, that's rather surprising. There's nothing there in the first place. What's stopping me? And of course, we know it's forces that are happening. You think you're sitting on the chair, but you're not. You're actually levitating. You don't have to be a ma magician to levitate. Uh, totally aside from this, but you all know the word abracadabra? You know, do magicians still say abracadabra? You know it's Hebrew? Abracadabra. It's two Hebrew words. Abra, I will create cadabra as I speak. So it's interesting that it just isn't a sign. But what, so you're levitating. You're levitating. Because think, just, try to, just try to push a magnet, the two positive poles together. They always slip aside. But that's what you got between here and the chair. And so you've got this little bit of a space in there, not, not even air. I mean, it's micro on, on the micro. But it's a reality. And it's totally different. That's the, that's the golden apple in the silver dish. The world is just, seems very simple, but there are phenomena in the world that are amazingly, subtly different from, uh, from how the uh, world is put together. So what about the biblical text? Let's just take one thing from the biblical text that we have here, and we'll get into some questions. There's a text passed around, I prefer if you don't throw it on the floor because it is part of the Bible. The, uh, the, uh, to try to understand how we, how we can find some subtleties within the biblical text that might let us then understand some of the aspects that go beyond the simple meaning. And that would be in this, in this diagram that will be on the board in a moment. I hope that the diagram will be on the board in a moment if I'm standing, if I'm standing in the way of that. Oh, this diagram, this diagram is directly from NASA. I would say anyone who is truly interested in their history, I say it's Siri, anyone's truly interested in the history, in their history in the universe, everything on this board is straight from NASA and it hasn't changed a word in almost eight years. I downloaded it eight, first time about five or six years ago. My students in class, every, every time I talk about this, like last week, and now they find it. You go to the website NASA, National you don't have to spell it out, just NASA, and when you get there, type in WMAP, the initials for that satellite, and uh, you get your history of the universe. Well, I'm not going to go into the, the, the diagram at the moment in depth, but just one factor that there's a creation, and eventually out of the creation comes such order as, as, as people. This is the timeline. The universe expands in all directions, but this is expansion over time. The lines of billions of years, and finally, from a burst of energy, we get something so clever, a satellite. This is our timeline here. If we wanted to see the universe 5 billion years ago, count back five lines, expand this in three directions, and you'll uh, find the universe then. This is us here. So what the diagram is said is out of a burst of energy, we get people or things that can be so clever, we call them people, that can actually make a satellite that can map the history of the universe and get two people the Nobel Prize. How could that possibly be? I mean, it doesn't make sense that in fact, such order could arise out of chaos. But yes, it does make sense if we understand the subtlety within the text. If you look at the text that were passed around, the, uh, start the, 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 the beginning, which has the word wisdom at the top, at the end of each day, the same sentence appears. You see in verse number five, 
This is Genesis chapter 1, by the way. This is the opening of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1 and a part of Genesis chapter 2. At the end of the first day, there's evening and morning, one day. Interesting. End of the second day, verse number 8, evening, morning, a second day. Verse 13, evening and morning, a third day. Now, I request that, please, if you'll skim through, starting verse 14, the major events of the fourth day. I mean, any, any suggestions what happens on the fourth day, the major, major events of the fourth day? Any thoughts? How about two great lights, right? Want to rule the day and want to rule the night? See that? Somewhere around verse eight, 16 or so, two great lights, the greater by the day, the lesser by night. Well, what could they be talking about? Any suggestions? What were they talking about? Yeah. You got a problem with the first three days? How do you have evening and morning for the first three days? Evening relates to sunset. Morning relates to sunrise. So there's a bit of a conflict here. I mean, couldn't God have gotten it right? You know, I mean, really, it's embarrassing. Of course, that would be the silver dish reading of the text. And you don't need the golden apple to get home on work on, from work on, on time in the evening. But it's rather interesting. For thousands of years, you know, for how long the English translation from since, since 1611, and even before the Septuagint, but since 1611, we've had the English from King James and then further translations. And it does say there is evening and morning in modern Hebrew. But the word evening, as Nachmanides points out, can't be the only meaning for the word. This is totally not Schroeder. It's Nachmanides. Make it very clear. Nachmanides points out almost a thousand years ago that how can you have evening and morning when there's no sun? So there must be a golden apple in the silver dish. And that explains what happens on that board right there. The golden apple is like this. The Hebrew word for evening is transliterated erev, ayin reish beit, erev, it's three Hebrew letters. Erev means in a silver dish reading, as opposed to the golden apple, the simple verse, is, the, is evening. But Nachmanides points out we have to look for the golden apple because there's no sun. So he says, what happens in evening to vision? It becomes blurry, chaotic. Because the root meaning of Erev, evening, is not evening. The root meaning of Erev is chaos, mixture. That's why evening means evening. There's a, uh, a tradition in, in, in Judaism on, on the Sabbath of, of not carrying things across boundaries. So you can put a, put a wall around a city or a string, you know, something symbolic around a city. It's called an Eruv. The Eruv, from the word Erev, Eruv, mixes all the domains. So all the domains become one because it's mixture. So erev, the Hebrew word translated as evening, has the basis of irbuv, of mixture, chaos. That's its root meaning. On the other hand, boker, the Hebrew word for morning is boker, bait kofresh, it's three Hebrew letters, and it means morning. But morning relates to sunrise, when vision becomes clear. At sunset, vision becomes blurry, chaotic, hence erev. In morning, vision becomes clear. Boker, live a care, to be able to understand, to, to recognize. So Nachmanides points out, which is, which is what the notes are on, on the text here, they've passed around, that the golden apple and the silver dish is that Erev gave way to Boker. That evening, the chaos gave way to order. And the Torah is astounded by that, and it wants us to be astounded by it also. Because it is un an unequivocal statement that order never arises spontaneously from a disorderly system and remains orderly. There's a whole, the sentence is, just, is, is a, a continuing sentence. The order, order never, not rarely, never arises spontaneously from a disorderly system and remains orderly unless something in nature has built that order in, recognizes the order and maintains it. I live in Jerusalem, just over the hill and down to, we got to the lowest, lowest exposed point on the face of the earth, the Dead Sea, or the it's called the Salt Sea in, in Genesis. In the book of Genesis, it's mentioned already in Genesis. The Salt Sea, the Dead Sea. You take a dish of the Dead Sea water, and you put it out in the sun, and it evaporates. And gradually, salt crystals form. Now, which atom of sodium will match up with bromine or chlorine, whatever? Which, atom, which of those atoms or ions match to form the crystal may be random. But the shape of the crystal has been built into this universe since the creation. The potential for salt crystals 
has been present in the universe since the creation. It is part of the chemistry of the world, which is part of the laws of nature. Which atom may form, which atom may form, that's a different story, but the shape is present. There's an example of order rising spontaneously from a disorderly system, the mass of things just moving around in liquid, and remaining orderly because nature has recognized it or it's part of the laws of nature. It's built into the system. And one begins to wonder, time and again, even atheist scientists say it looks like the universe knew we were coming, that it just seems that things are built so perfectly. The uh, Scientific American a few years ago, in, in, in a cover issue, Infinite Earths in Parallel Universes Really Exist. That's the title. But then you open the text and read it, and they don't really know. Maybe yes, maybe no. And what's the information that we have of Infinite Earths in Parallel Universes Really Existing, which is on the cover, so you bought the journal. And it's the most widely read science journal in the world, but not peer-reviewed, and has a spin that is highly materialistic, naturalistic. The information, as they say point blank, is our universe is so perfect, so perfect for complex life, that it infers, that's the word, now it's infer, it infers the existence of other universes because our laws of nature, they claim, were established by random processes at the birth of the universe. Therefore, there must be other universes that don't have these laws because randomness couldn't produce this perfection. But you realize what they're saying that if we, where the same, where the Bernard Carr says it from the Imperial uh, College in London, if you don't want God, you better have many universes for the multiverse. If you don't want God, you better have a multiverse. Because the universe, and, and that's a statement from Scientific American, which is 100% in its approach, uh, let's say naturalistic, put it that way. So, so the Torah is so amazed by this flow from energy to life that six times over, it hammers it, hammers it home, 